G'day everyone, welcome to ITS 300 Web Development 1. For this week's lesson, we're going to have another pre recorded class in continuation to our discussion about web development. Last week, we've discussed about HTML or Hypertext Markup Language. And uh, for this week, we're going to continue with the discussion. And this time, we'll be talking about Cascading Style Sheets or CSS. So be sure to watch the entire video, listen, and understand the lessons attentively. Because after this class, I will be giving assignment to be posted through our respective Google Classrooms. My name is Julius Publico, your instructor. Let's get started. By the way, again, if you have any questions or clarifications, I'll share it with the class, comment your questions down to our Facebook group, or you can share it through our respective Facebook chat groups as well. So again, to review, last time we've discussed about the HTML or hypertext markup language, and we've talked about the HTML5, which is the latest version of the HTML. We've talked about some of the HTML tags, particularly headings, paragraphs, links, images. We also talked about the HTML attributes that includes lang, href, title, size, style, ID, and class. And again, there are a lot of HTML tags and HTML attributes, and um, we cannot just discuss them in one lesson. So I've asked you to review and do an advanced study about HTML tags and html attributes and um, i gave you a link particularly the www.w3schools.com so i'm expecting that everybody has done so because in this lesson we're going to be talking um html tags that we haven't discussed last time so i'm just expecting that everybody has done their own research and advanced study and that way, we don't necessarily have to repeat again what we've discussed last time and what we haven't discussed about HTML. Okay, if you haven't watched that video yet, copy the link on your screen right now or just click on the image once you've already uploaded a copy of this presentation file online. And um, again, today we're going to talk about cascading style sheets and we're going to break it down to what is CSS or cascading style sheets. The CSS syntax, the three ways to use CSS, CSS selectors, and uh, lastly, we'll be talking about CSS basics. So, if you can remember in our previous discussion about coding, formatting is a coding process that allows a control on how the HTML tags will look like once it's rendered on the web browser. The skating shells. Cascading style sheets or CSS is one of the most notably used language for formatting. So first is what is CSS? CSS stands for cascading style sheets. It is a style sheet language used to describe the presentation of an HTML document and how the elements should be rendered on the screen. CSS defines styles of web pages including design, layout, and variation in display across devices and screen sizes. So, not only the CSS is capable of formatting HTML elements, it is also making sure that a web page, the entire web page will be able to display properly regardless of the screen resolution and screen sizes. Okay, I'm talking about the devices where you're going to view the web page. It could be either mobile phone, tablets, um, and uh, personal computers. So here's an example on how CSS describes HTML elements. Okay, so this is the basic syntax of CSS. In this example, the entire HTML body element is set with blue background color, and the paragraph element is set with 20 pixel font size and a gold color. Okay, so if you can remember, the body here is the HTML element, and this is the declaration. The declaration contains the property on how the body should display and that will be the same with the paragraph so p stands for paragraph we can remember in our dis previous discussion and then here inside this curly brackets are the declarations that defines how the paragraph element should look like more of it will be discussed in a few moments so let's talk about the css syntax on or how do we write css so a CSS rule set is composed of a selector and a declaration block, okay? 
So this is an example of CSS rule set. It is composed of a selector, which is the P, and the declaration block. The selector targets the element we want to style. The declaration blocks are grouped in, of course, blocks. Each declaration block contains CSS declarations, which are wrapped by an open curly brackets. If you can see, we have open curly brace and close curly brace. CSS declaration or declarations are contained inside the declaration block. Each declaration has to be separated by a semicolon. Otherwise, the codes won't work. It is, however, allowed not to put a semicolon on the last declaration. Okay, so if we're going to take a look on our rule set in here, we have our selector and our declaration block. Each line inside the declaration block is called, obviously, declaration. So right here in our example, we have two declarations and each of them are separated with a semicolon. Now, if it's going to be the last declaration, you don't have to put semicolon but of course, just to be sure and just to be consistent and formal, we can just put semicolon in there as well. Now, inside a CSS declaration, it is composed of a pair of property and a value separated by a colon. So if you can remember, we have here the selector, we have the declaration block, and then we have the declaration. Now, the declaration is composed of a pair of property and value. Now, the property and value must be separated with a colon. Okay, so we have here, for example, font size is 20 px or pixel. Okay, that means the font size of the paragraph element should be 20 pixel. Okay, when you say property, it is a human readable identifier that indicates which stylistic feature to change. And then the value is, it is given to a property which indicates how the specified stylistic feature should be changed. In CSS, there are more than 300 properties and almost an infinite number of different values. Note, not all pairs of properties and values are allowed. Each property has a specific list of valid values. So just like HTML, there are lots of different properties for CSS. For today's lesson, we're just going to talk about some of the most important um, properties for CSS and it will be your job to do an advanced research and learning about CSS. Again, you can go to www.w3schools.com and then select Learn CSS, okay? Alright, so let's review what we've learned so far with CSS syntax. Again, we have here the rule set. The rule set composed of selector and a declaration block, okay? And then the declaration block contains with lines of declaration. And then each declaration contains property and value separated with a semicolon. And that is how we write a CSS rule set. Again, for the complete list of CSS properties, go to www w3schools.com slash CSS and select CSS preference. You'll see the complete list of the CSS properties together with the values which is necessary for that particular property. Now that we know how to write CSS properties, this time we're going to learn how to use it for HTML because again our rule in doing CSS is to design our HTML elements. Now, there are three ways on how we can use CSS in an HTML document. We have internal, external, and inline styling. When you say internal styling or internal CSS, the CSS rules are written inside the HTML document using the style tag inside the head element. We'll see what that is all about in a moment. External CSS. A CSS file containing all the CSS rules are saved separately and must be linked with the HTML document. With an external style sheet, you can change the look of an entire website using one CSS file. Now, to link a CSS file, we will use the link tag. The example is right here. So we have linked rel, that is the rel attribute for link, and then style sheet, meaning we are trying to link a style sheet file to our HTML page and then href 
if you can probably remember, it defines the location of the file that we are trying to link. For example, we have here file name dot css this is the file name of the css file that we are trying to link to our html file and then of course it is all enclosed with open and close angle brackets for the opening tag and then we close it with slash link okay and then lastly we have internal styling this is useful for styling a single element we will use the style attribute inside the opening tag of the element we are trying to style for example we are working on an html page and we are trying to design or format the paragraph tag so to do so in internal styling we just have to include the style attribute and then write in the css declaration okay so these are the ways of using css looks like so in the internal css we will write our css properties inside the head section okay and then we use the style elements in external css we created a separate file and then we link that file to our web page so that whatever it is that we're going to put in our cs separated css file will apply to the html okay and then the inline styling looks just like this so the CSS properties are enclosed inside the HTML tag. All right. So either of these three will work in using CSS. However, these two, the internal CSS and inline styling, they are a little bit limited when it comes to functionality. Why? Because when we say internal CSS, all the CSS properties will only affect to the HTML file where it belongs. Similar with inline styling, the CSS property will only affect to the HTML element that it is also included. For example, the CSS property will only work with the H1 and these CSS properties will only work for the entire web page. The most practical way in using CSS is of course the external CSS. That is because, like I said, we can design an entire website with just one single file we just have to make sure that our css file is connected to each web page in our website okay so since external css is the most practical way in using css this is the method that we're going to be using from this point and on okay all right so now that we know how to connect our css file to our html file we just have to make sure that all the formatting, all the designing that we'll be doing in the CSS will work in our HTML. So how do we do that? We use HTML selectors. Again, CSS uses reference so that all the properties will be applied to the HTML. So again, we'll be using CSS selectors. CSS selectors are used to find or select the HTML element you want to style. The following are simple CSS selectors. So we have element selectors. It is the simplest way to target all elements of a given type. The element selector selects HTML element based on the element name. For example, P. Okay, if you can remember in our previous discussion, P is paragraph in HTML. So if you wanted to format paragraph element, we just have to type P in our CSS file. In this particular example, we have text align center color red. This means that all P or paragraph elements on the page will be center aligned and with a red text color. Okay, again, we'll talk more about these properties in just a few moments. Another type of class selectors, the class attribute. If you can remember last time, we've discussed about attributes and one of them being the class class can be used as css selector so multiple elements can have the same class values the class selector selects html elements with a specific class attribute to select elements with a specific class write period followed by the class name okay so in this example all html elements with center class will be read and center aligned 
And then next, we have ID selectors. The ID selector uses the ID attribute of an HTML element to select a specific element. The ID of an element is unique within a page. So the ID selector is used to select one unique element. To select an element with a specific ID, write a hash character followed by the ID of the element. Okay, so basically you can use either of the two. We can use class and then we can also use ID. It will be totally up to you. The only difference between the ID and class is that class can be used for multiple HTML elements, while ID can only be used for one specific type of element. Let's say, for example, you can name class, you can name the same class for, let's say, paragraph, h1, body, and any other HTML elements. But for ID, once you've already set an ID for a specific element, you cannot use that particular ID with another HTML element. Okay? So that would be the preparation on how do we use CSS. This time, we're going to learn some of the CSS properties for HTML. Okay? So let's start with the colors. CSS colors are commonly specified using color name, hexadecimal color value, and RGB color value. So CSS colors allows us to add colors to our HTML element. And to do that, we just have to specify the color using the actual color name. So it could be either red, orange, blue, maroon, so on, so on and so forth. We can also use the hexadecimal color value, just like this in, the exa in this example. Or we can also use the RGB color value. Now, you may be wondering, how do we know the hexadecimal value of a color? And um, how do we know the RGB value of a certain color? There are a lot of ways how you can determine the hexadecimal and uh, RGB value of a color. And um, we'll discuss that shortly. Okay, so let's take a look on the examples that we have here. In the first one, we set the color of the element with a color maroon. So we're using color name, which is in this case, maroon. And in the second example, we set the color using the hexadecimal value. You will know that it is hexadecimal value because, because it starts with a hashtag and then followed by six alphanumeric characters. And then in the third example, we have RGB color value. So you will know that it's RGB, of course. It's got RGB in it. And then three numerical values enclosed with a parenthesis you'll know how to determine the hexadecimal value and RGB color values of any color in just a moment. Either of these three will work. Okay, so let's open up our Notepad++ and let's have an example. Let's create an HTML file first. All right, and then let's create a new folder containing our CSS. You don't necessarily have to put the CSS file inside a folder, but just to be organized, it's always best to organize different file types separately. So since HTML is different from CSS, that's why we put it into a different folder. So let's save our CSS file as style.css. Always remember, that the file extension for CSS is, of course, CSS, okay? So let's open both of this. We have the style CSS, and then we have our index CSS. Okay, so let's write the basic structure of an HTML file. All right, so we have now created the basic structure of our HTML file. We just have to save it. Now let's connect our CSS file to our HTML file. Again, we will use the tag and it must be written inside the head element. So we'll say link rel and then style sheet. That means we are trying to connect a style sheet file to our HTML file. And then next is going to be the href. This will allow our HTML file to locate the CSS file. So in our case, it is inside the CSS folder, and then the file name is style.css. All right, and then we will close link. 
All right. So right now, it, our CSS file should be connected now to our HTML file. The one thing that's left to do is we're going to test whether it is so. Let's start probably by changing the background color of our HTML file. Which element should we select? Since we're talking about the entire HTML body, so of course that will be the body. And then for us to call the body, we will use the element selector. We just have to write body. And then our declaration block. The declaration block again must be enclosed with open and close curly braces. Okay, so for us to change the background color, we'll talk more about it in just a moment, but it is background color and then there's a colon and then the actual color we will try to use the color name so we'll say maroon for example let's save make sure both of the files are saved and then let's open it up all right so we know that our css file is successfully connected to our html file because it actually worked we set the background color to maroon so the first rule is we can change uh, we can set the color using the color name second would be the hexadecimal color value and then let's change the background color to hashtag 8000 let's save that and then let's open up our browser let's try to reload now once we reload it nothing will look like it's happening because we just changed it to maroon but using hexadecimal value let's try okay so it looks like nothing happened because we just set it to maroon now what if we'll try to use another color how do we know the hexadecimal color for let's say orange all right there are a lot of ways to do that but the, but the most commonly used is of course if you have internet connectivity you can go to w3schools.com and then select color picker which is at the bottom of the website select the color that you want or if you're not so sure you can type the name in here so let's say orange and then click ok and then the hexadecimal value for orange is this so you just have to copy that and then paste it right here save and then let's open up our browser all right so we've changed our background color to orange so the second rule is correct we proved the second rule is true that we can use hexadecimal color value for css colors now we have here the third one which is using the rgb color value so same thing you can use the w3schools.com's color picker to get the rgb value so right here we have the rgb 255 165 and 0 that is also orange so let's try another color here let's say this oh, let's search blue all right and then let's use the rgb color value let's use it to change the color of our background save and then let's reload all right so all of these three methods are fine when it comes to css colors okay so here are some of the basic css colors you might want to take a screenshot so we have your maroon red orange yellow olive green we have the hex code or hexadecimal code and then we have the decimal code which is the rgb value okay and then for more variety of colors you just go to www.w3schools.com slash color slash color picker dot asp or again just go to just go to the website and then select color picker for more color reference all right so next let's talk about css backgrounds so you can fill the HTML elements backgrounds with a color or image, clipped or resized, and otherwise be modified. So the CSS background properties, we have background color, which we've just discussed. We can also have background image, background repeat, background position, background attachment. So these are the most common um, CSS properties for backgrounds. All right, so let's talk about background color. So the background color property specifies the background color of an element so for example here changing the background color of a whole page just like what we did a while ago we set the background color of the body and in this example we set it with gold 
The same method applies to the CSS colors just a while ago. We can neither use a color name, we can use hexadecimal color value, or we can also use the RGB color value. Now, the background color is not just for putting background color to the entire website or the web page. We can also set background colors to just about any HTML elements. So for example, here we can set a background color to our h1 element and then to do that let's open up our html file and then let's say h1 come to my site and then let's try to put a background color for this element so to do that we just have to add here h1 that is our element selector and then let's change the background color to let's say gold and then let's open up our browser all right so we've just successfully set a background to our html element so again the background color does not just apply to the entire web page we can also use it to set backgrounds to just about any element background image the background image property sets image as background of an element the format of its value should be URL and then the file name. The file name must be enclosed with double quotation mark and then it must be enclosed with open and close parentheses. For example, here we set the background image with a specific image. All right. So by default, the background picture will be repeating both sideways and downwards to cover the entire browser screen and will be placed at top left corner. What do you mean by that? Let's just try. So first is we're just going to add a back. A picture on our website and I've already done so the picture is inside the IMG folder let's open up our, our note to plus plus and let's change our background color to an actual image and to do that we have to add first a picture to our website I've already included a picture in my website here it's inside the IMG folder and the file name is background dot jpg and that is how it should look like all right and next is of course we're going to change our property to background image and then the value which is url and then open and closed parenthesis open and close quotation marks and then the location now supposedly we will write the folder name and then the file name which is background that jpg here and then save now let's see what happens okay nothing happened why is that so remember that our css file is inside a folder which is called css here now we have to tell our css file first to go outside the css folder before going into the image folder and to do that we just have to add some codes to our css value and that is dot dot slash okay so this will tell the css file to go outside the css folder before going into the img folder let's save that and let's open up our browser again all right we've just changed our background from color to an image if you've noticed the picture is a little too big all right but the moment that you zoom it out you will see that the picture is going to repeat if you can see right here this is another part of this portion right because by default the picture will automatically repeat horizontally and vertically now there are ways to control that and that will be using the background image repeat property by default css automatically sets the background images horizontally and vertically you can control the repeat by just horizontally or repeat x and vertically or repeat y only or no repeat at all okay so again if you just want to repeat our background horizontally we can write the value repeat x or if you want to repeat vertically only then we can just say repeat y but if you don't want to have our background image to repeat at all then we will write no repeat on value so let's say for example first is we're just going to decrease the size of the image 
So in that way, we'll be able to see how it worked. Please give me a moment. Alright, by purpose, I've decreased the size of the picture and that way we'll be able to see what's going on. So right now, the pictures are repeating. So let's try to, let's say, let's start by just setting up to repeat horizontally. We just have to use the background repeat property. So let's say, background repeat and then repeat x. This is repeating the background horizontally. Let's reload. All right, so if you can see, the background picture only repeats horizontally and not vertically. We can also do it vertically by just changing it to repeat Y. That means it's going to be repeating in Y axis or vertical. See? However, if you don't want the background picture to repeat at all, then you just have to write no repeat. Save and then reload. Okay? As you can see, the picture is no longer repeating. Next is, we can set the background position. We can set the initial position of a background image using the background position property. Because right now, by default, the background image is located at the top left corner of the picture. We can set it to wherever we want, right, by using the background position. So we can set it either to the top, left, right, center, bottom, left top, left center left bottom right top right center right bottom center top center 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 bottom okay so let's try let's try to move this particular background image to somewhere else so we will use background position let's change it to let's say right okay let's save that and then let's reload okay okay we've just moved our background color to the right side of the of the screen all right so you can try all of these values in setting up your background color um your background image rather next is background image attachment the background attachment property sets whether a background image position is fixed within the viewport or scrolls with its containing block these are the values for background attachment so for scroll the background image will scroll with a page, so this is by default. Fixed, the background image will not scroll with a page. And then local, the background image will scroll with the element's content. So what do you mean by that? So let's open up our browser again. And right now, we cannot say if the picture is scrolling or not because we don't have any other contents in our web page. So let me just add a few more elements and that way we'll be able to scroll our web page. Please allow me just a moment. Okay, I just added a few changes to our web page. We are now able to scroll our web page. Now, if you can see, the background image is also scrolling together with the entire page. There are ways that you can control on how the background image scrolls by using the background attachment. So by default, again, it is scrolling. However, if you want the background image to stay, even if you're scrolling the entire web page, you can do that by using the fixed value. Okay, so let's open up our Note++ plus plus, and then let's just remove the background position. And then let's add the background attachment. And then we don't want it to scroll, so we will write fixed, and then let's reload. All right, so right now it is back to the top left corner by default. And uh, look if we scroll down. Look at the right side of the screen. We have the scroll bar. If you're going to scroll it down, all right, the rest of the web page is scrolling aside from the background. Okay, so that is background attachment. Next, let's talk about CSS borders. The CSS border properties allow you to specify the style, width, and color of an element's border. So these are the CSS border properties. We have border width, border style, border color. The border width specifies the width of the border. The default value is medium. The border style specifies the style of the border. The default value is none. 
and then we have the border color specifies the color of the border default value is the color of the text so here are some of the example of the border style so this is going to be um, adding just a little bit of dynamics to the border of your element so we have here dotted dashed solid double groove ridge inset outset none hidden and then we can either have all of it together dotted dash solid double so basically you can set each side of the border from top right bottom left just combining four um, border styles so the first one represents the top the second would be the right bottom and then left okay so let's just have a few example and then you can try it on your own okay so let's try with the dotted we're just going to add it with our h1 element so first is let's just remove our background color for us to be able to see it properly so we will write border style and then let's start with dotted all right and then let's save that let's reload all right so remove the background color and now we have a dotted border in our h1 element so we can also try let's say solid which will give you a solid straight color straight line rather just like that and then we have let's say a double border let's just write it as double just like that now if we want if we want to combine multiple um, border style then we can just combine them all together at once so all we need to do so let's say we want the top to be double the right side to be dotted and we want the bottom to be solid and the left side to be uh, what else do we have here um, let's say no border so let's say none okay again we have here the top right bottom and then left let's save that and let's open up our browser again all right let's check so we have here the top is doubled as expected and then we have on the right side we have dotted and then the bottom is solid and then we don't have any border on the left side okay that is the border property values okay so you can also you can try with the different properties that we have here we can you can also change the border color you just have the right border color you can change the border width just write border width and then set it yourself so for the color you can use the color value hexadecimal value or rgb color value for the width you can use pixel point etc etc Next, let's talk about the CSS margin. The CSS margin properties are used to create space around elements outside of any defined borders. With CSS, you have full control over the margins. There are properties for setting the margins for each side of the element. It could be either top, right, bottom, and left. CSS has properties for specifying the margin for each side of an element. So the properties are margin top, margin right, margin bottom, and then margin left. So again, margin creates a space between elements. All right, so what we are talking about, let's open up our notepad again. And so we want to set a margin outside our H1 element. So that means if there are margin outside that element, then that means there has to be space outside that particular element. So let's just add, let's say margin top let's set it to 100 px so we're expecting that there must be 100 pixel of space from top to bottom let's reload okay all right so as you can see we've created space from the h1 at the top part of the element we've set it with a 100 pixel margin we can also do the same thing with left right and then bottom okay all the margin properties must have or can have the following values we can either write it in length so this specifies a margin in pixel point cm etc we can also use auto the browser calculates the margin automatically we can also use percent 
that specifies a margin in percent of the width of the containing element and then inherit specifies a margin should be inherited from the parent element so let's say for example if we will use percent instead let's add about 30 percent at the top margin let's save that and reload so right now it is giving a 30 percent of the entire screen at the top of the h1 element okay so again you can either use length and the actual specific margin size or we can use auto percent and inherit we can also set all the four margins of any element using only one property only. This is through the use of the margin property. The margin property can have one, two, or three, or four values. Just like what we did with the border style a while ago, where we set each sides with different styles, we can also do that with margin. Okay, when one value is specified, it applies the same margin to all four sides. So for example, let's open up our notepad plus plus again and then let's remove margin top and then instead just write margin and then if we say we want to add 100 pixels then the 100 pixel will apply on all the sides okay so right now it's got 100 pixel at the top 100 pixel at the left and then we have 100 pixel at the right and of course we also have 100 pixel at the bottom okay we can't see it properly now because we don't have any other element but if we have elements right next to the h1 we will see it will be written somewhere here okay when two values are specified the first value applies to the top and bottom the second to the left and right now if we're going to put two values in here let's say 50 a 150 the first one will apply to the top and bottom of this element and then the second one will be applied to the left and right so let's reload it all right so right now if you've noticed the top margin is a lot bigger than the left and right it's because we set the top margin to be 100 and then this the right and left to be 50. now what if there are three values when three values are specified, the first value applies to the top, the second to the left and right, and the third to the bottom. So we can try that if we add, let's say, 40 px. So the 100 will be applied to the top, the 50 will be applied to the left and right, and then the 40 will be applied at the bottom. So let's save that, let's reload. All right, so somewhere here, there should be 40 pixels of margin so again we cannot see it right now it's because we don't have any other elements however if you if you write four values the margins apply to the top right bottom and left of the same order respectively so let's say for example if we will add another value here so we have here the top the right the bottom and left so let's check all right so we have 100 we have 50 we have 40 and we have 30 okay so that is margins so again the margins will create a space outside the element last is we have paddings so css paddings create space within an element it clears an area around the inside of an element similar to margins you have full control over the padding there are properties for setting the margin for each side of the element it could be either top right bottom and left css has properties for specifying the padding for each side of the element we have padding top right padding bottom padding left the valid values for paddings are length that will be in cmpx or cm or centimeter pixel etc and we can also use per percentage okay so basically paddings are just similar with margins the only thing that they differ is that margins are outside the element padding is inside the element okay so for example we want to set a specific distance from this border to our welcome to my site element or the h1 element to do that we will use the padding okay let's open up our notepad plus plus and we will add padding again similar with the margin we can either say padding top 
just like what we did with the margin a while ago let's say 100 px so we are setting 100 pixels from the h1 to the border so let's reload see okay so we've set 100 pixel of padding from the h1 which is welcome to my side to its border okay so similar with the margin we can also set it in one go by writing the specific length for each side so again if we will write one value then it will be applied to all of the sides if we will add two values then it will be applied to top and bottom and then left to right and then if we applied it if we applied three values then the first one would be a top the second would be left and right and then the third would be bottom but if you're going to put all four values then it's going to be applied to the four sides as well so let's say let's do the same thing we have 150 uh, 100 we have 50 we have 40 and then we have 30 okay again we have top right bottom left let's reload so we have 100 at the top and then 50 on this side it looks like it's a lot because we don't have any other elements to the right but it should have 50 pixels perhaps somewhere here and then we have 40 at the bottom and then 30 on the left side all right so that will be the end of the discussion about the css properties again see the complete list of css properties please go to www.w3schools.com select css okay again i will be expecting everybody to have an advanced research and learning about this lesson so so you can comply with the assignment that i'll be giving you for now that will be the end for today's lesson please check the next video for the continuation of this discussion Thank you so much for making this part of the video. Keep yourself safe and God bless us all.